Matthew chapter 9, Matthew 9, 32 through 34 is our text. And I do find it interesting what Matthew does. And these miracles in particular, and towards the end of the sermon, we'll touch on that. He puts these miracles together. I said this morning that Matthew is not focused on chronology. He's not just writing a biography of Jesus. Um, if he was, he, I think, in fact, if you want a, bi- a chronology of Jesus, a biography of Jesus, maybe Luke might be a little better, especially if you want the Galilean ministry focused on. If you want more of his ministry in Judea focused on, then maybe John would be good. Um, uh, and Mark fits Luke fairly well. But Matthew, I think Matthew kind of throws out the chronology thing. It just says, look, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use all of Jesus' life to teach uh, who the king of the kingdom is, and to use and put everything in the order that makes sense to teach what I'm striving to teach. And, and so I, I think that this here in this section, I can't say definitively uh, what I come up with here, what I tell you later on, I can't admit to the servant, but towards the end, and I'll, ca- I'll qualify it when we get there, whether that was Matthew's mind or not, but I think it's something really cool we're going to see in this text, including the text we've been in the last couple of weeks. So it's Matthew chapter 9, verses 32 through 34. Let me read that, and, and then let's ask the Lord for his help again. Now as they were going out, behold, a mute, demon-possessed man was brought to him. And after the demon was cast out, the mute man spoke, and the crowds marveled, saying, Nothing like this has ever been seen in Israel. But the Pharisees were saying, he casts out the demons by the ruler of the demons. Father, again, we need your help all the time, so dependent on you. I thank you for your goodness and your grace and your mercy that you are an ever-present help in a time of need. And so this evening, as we review your word and study your word and focus on Christ, that you would help clear our minds, clear my speech, that it might go forth in power for your glory and honor. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I know we're in Matthew, but I'm going to turn to Romans. And you're welcome to turn there with me if you would like. Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10, we're going to, I'm going to look briefly at verses 12 through 17 here. And in this section of Scripture, Paul gives us the primary ordained means of how God brings people to himself. God's, God can bring people to himself any way that he desires, right? God can do as he pleases. But this is the way God primarily brings people to himself. Paul describes it here in verses 12 through 15, 17 of Romans 10. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek, for the same Lord is Lord of all, abounding in riches for all who call on him. For whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? How will they believe in him whom they have not heard? And how will they hear without a preacher? And how will they preach unless they are sent? Just as it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who proclaim good news of good things. However, they did not all heed the good news. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our report? So faith comes from hearing, and hearing by the word of Christ. This is God's primary way of bringing people to himself. He begins talking about the fact that there's no distinction between Jew or Greek, Jew or Gentile, that in Christ we're all one. We all come to the same Jesus, the same Lord, right? We don't come to different streams of Christ or something like that. We, there's only one way, one truth, one life. It's Jesus, John 14, 6. And so he being the only way, truth, and life, Jew, Greek, man, woman, slave, free, we all come to Christ through Jesus. And that's what he begins with there, talking about whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. It doesn't matter if you are a human being and you call on the name of the Lord in the sense that Paul means it here, then you're saved. Then you become a redeemed person. But then Paul points out, he says, how will they call on the one whom they've not believed? And and there's an essence here of what we talked about this morning, spiritual sight. Unless they have spiritual sight to believe 
who Jesus is, who Jesus says he is, that he is both Lord and Christ, how would they call on him? I mean, how would they call on Jesus if they don't believe he is who he says he is? So they need to believe. But then he points out, he says, but how will they believe in him whom they have not heard? Obviously, if we're going to believe on someone, we have to have heard of that someone or heard from that someone. And I think primarily Paul means heard from the word of Christ and were heard from through the word being preached to them. And how can they believe in someone they've never heard of or heard from? And then he says, and how will they hear without a preacher? Somebody has to go and tell them. And Paul doesn't necessarily mean a preacher like me. We're all supposed to be preachers, preachers of the gospel, preachers of Christ. You know, we talked about that this morning. The, the blind men, they went out, and what did they do? They, they spread the news about, right? They became preachers because they were sent, and that's what Paul says. How will they preach unless they are sent? And so they needed to be redeemed, and then, in fact, in their case, they were told not to go do this, and they couldn't help themselves, and they went, and... We, on the other hand, are sent to go share the gospel with others. This is God's primary means of reaching people. He says, just as it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news or proclaim good news of good things. And if you know anything about me, I don't like feet. I hate feet. <laughs> I don't like my own feet. My wife will put her feet on me and say, oh, look how beautiful my feet. Get those away from me. I love my wife. I don't love her feet, you know. <laughs> yeah, Paul, so this is a hard text for me. How beautiful are the feet of those who proclaim good news, but we know what Paul means here. He's not talking about their toes and their ankles and, and the smelly fungus that's on them. He is talking here about the one who brings the good news and, and how beautiful it is. You may have in your own salvation testimony someone who brought you good news you may remember the person who brought you good news, and, and if you receive that good news from the feet of that person, in a sense, you probably think, that person's beautiful to me, because they brought me the gospel, whether it was a parent, whether it was a friend, a relative of some sort, or, or maybe even a stranger that happens, somebody you didn't know, and they brought the, the good news to you, and you said, man, that's beautiful. You, I would even say the one who brought me good news of the gospel has beautiful feet, even though I don't like feet. And uh, he goes on, though, and he says in the final portion, you're talking about the Jewish people primarily, because he refers to Isaiah 53. However, they did not all heed the good news, for Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our reports. And referring to that text in Isaiah 53, where future Jews look back on Jesus and say, we missed it. We didn't see it. We didn't recognize who he was. But then he points out in verse 17... So faith comes from hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. It is through the word of Christ that, through the hearing of the word of Christ, that we call upon the name of the Lord by having spiritual sight given to us. Jew, Gentile, does not matter. Now, I use that as, as background here, because here we're going to see three responses, I believe, to the word of Christ that we see in our text here. And it's only three verses, but... I believe we're going to see three responses here to the word of Christ. And so response number one here, we have the friends of the mute man, or you could say the mute demon-possessed man, either way. Verse 32, it says, Now as they were going out, behold, a mute demon-possessed man was brought to him. Notice how Matthew starts this section. He connects it directly to the previous section. What does he say? As they were going out. Who is they, that is the blind men, in the previous section? As the blind men were going out doing what? Spreading the news about him, it says. Spreading the news about Jesus. As they went out, spreading throughout all the land, the news of Jesus, spreading the word of Christ, these people bring a mute, demon-possessed man to Jesus. He, he links these two narratives, and I believe, it doesn't say it explicitly in the text, but I do believe that it's very likely that these people who bring this mute demon-possessed man to Christ have heard of Christ through the testimony 
of these two blind men. They were spreading the news, and these people here, wait a minute. He did this for these two blind guys who are no longer blind? What could he do for our mute, demon-possessed friend? What could he do for him? These, that's, I believe that's what these men who bring the, blind, or the, mute, the demon-possessed man to him, I believe that is, that is the driving factor, that the testimony of the blind men and what God has done for him, the him, the two men, what God has done for them, I believe that drives these people to say, we need to get our friend to Jesus too. We need to take our friend there too. Now I want you to know, not all come. Not all respond. Paul said that in Romans 10. Not all respond favorably. But one man responds. Or one man's friends bring him, if you want to put it that way. So they bring this mute man to Jesus, this mute demon-possessed man. Now, let's talk about muteness just a little bit. Being mute is tied to being deaf oftentimes. Um, The word itself could be deaf-mute. Um, it could be deaf, and it could be mute. So it could be any of those. Um, so he could have been deaf and mute. He could have been just mute. Probably the translators chose the word mute because later on, Jesus, when he heals him, he, when he casts out the demon, he speaks. And so since he speaks, we know for sure he was mute. Now, whether he was deaf or not could be a little bit in question. But if you, if you understand, if you've been around anybody who experienced deafness, who has deafness, you, you know that that impacts their speech, doesn't it? I, I had a friend growing up whose mom was deaf, and her mom was able to make noise, um, but she was not able to communicate well. She tries sometimes with some of us teenagers trying to correct us and yell at us, and um, usually we'd be like, I don't know what your mom just said. You know, I think she's yelling at me, but I don't know what she's saying. You know? um, but for the most part, many deaf people won't, even if they have the ability to, they they don't have the ability to know what they sound like, you know, which, is, which has to be a strange thing to be deaf, to be able to speak, but you can't hear yourself. That, that might be one of the more difficult things about being deaf. And, and so many of them don't say much because they, they may be self-conscious of the fact that they don't enunciate properly. And so many of them will present themselves as mute to some degree and use their vocal cords very, very limited way. And... Um, this particular man, if he was deaf, he would have protections like the blind man, wouldn't he? He, he? he would have protections that you're not supposed to curse a deaf man. That's what, and God cares for the afflicted. And we've got to keep that in mind as we go through all these narratives that in the Old Testament, despite the fact that many of these people were restricted from certain types of services, they were um, cared for by God. That God said, do not curse a deaf man. Why? Because they can't hear you. They can't defend themselves. How cruel is it to curse a deaf man? You know, when we talk about these things about the heart of man and being cruel to others, it reminds me when I was a kid, um, I was with my dad, and, and I remember being in a parking lot. I don't, um, I don't know what we were doing. I just know we were there, and I saw somebody. I don't remember what they looked like, what they were doing, but I made fun of them, something that they couldn't help. And I was probably... I don't know, eight, nine years old, something like that, maybe a little bit older, a little bit younger. And I made fun of this individual, and I don't know that I've ever been more rebuked strongly by my dad verbally than that moment. My dad just looked at me, and he said, I don't ever want to hear you picking on somebody who can't help something and making fun of them. And it it hit me later. My dad had polio as a kid, so he limped from about probably you know, the young teenage years, maybe even before that. And i got to imagine, going through school, my dad probably experienced the other end of that. And, and I'm thankful for a dad that rebuked me, that corrected, that disciplined his son to drive that foolishness and that wickedness out of my heart. I still remember that to this day here, probably 40 years later, that correction my dad gave me. And my dad really was demonstrating the heart of God in that. That God would say the same thing. You don't be cruel to somebody. I remember my dad even saying something to the effect of, look, if somebody's stupid because they just act stupid, that's one thing. But these people can't help it, you know. 
And so he kind of left a little room to make fun of stupid people, you know, who just act stupidly, who don't do what's wise and they know better. He said, but when somebody doesn't know better or can't help it, that's where you have to be merciful. And my dad had drilled that into me, and I'm thankful for that. And God would say the same thing about all of these people that Christ has compassion on. When we see Christ have compassion on them, some people would say, oh, that must not be the God of the Old Testament. The God of the Old Testament didn't have that type. Yes, he did have that type of compassion. Jesus is the God of the Old Testament, and he has the same compassion that God expresses in the Old Testament for those who are afflicted. Now, this man in particular, though, is especially afflicted, isn't he? Because it's not just mute and maybe deafness, but it's demon possession. Demon possession. And some people worry about demon possession. I know we talked a little bit about this back when we were in a previous text in chapter 8 towards the end of chapter 8, when the men were saved from the demons, those violent men. But I do want to just touch on it a little bit tonight, that demon possession is not something that I believe the Christian needs to worry about. The Christian gains the Holy Spirit. Greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. If we are indwelt with the Holy Spirit, how can something else take that place where the Spirit resides? No demon could ever do that to a Christian. And, and I don't think demon possession is even something, I mean, we don't have a doctrine on demon possession that's really clear. There's a little bit of gray area here, but I don't believe that a demon can just go possess any individual, any human being. I don't think people should walk around going, boy, I'm worried about the demons coming and taking me over, you know. But I would say this, that Christians, first of all, should never play around with things dealing with the occult, with tarot cards and fortune tellers and Ouija boards and all of those things, we have no business, no business at all, messing with demonic spiritual powers. We don't know what we're dealing with. We don't, we don't know the power that is there. He is the prince and power of the air, the enemy Satan is. He's a real power. And we are, we are not as wise as he is. You say, what do you mean? Well, I mean, in the sense of smart, maybe. Not wise might be the wrong choice. Maybe the word smart. He's seen more than we have. He's been around longer than we have. He learns more than we have. He's a more intelligent being than we are. He's a more powerful being than we are. We don't know what's going on in that spiritual realm. And why would Christians ever play in that? I don't know. But, boy, young people, if you're ever tempted to play around in that area, just flee. Just run. The Bible warns about sorcery and witchcraft in the Old Testament, and we ought to have nothing to do with it. People in the world, however, they like to play around with different things, don't they? They like to play around with the mysterious, and so we see that happening in our world today. And, and I do believe that is kind of the entrance level for this type of possession or oppression or demon influence on somebody is people open themselves up to it. They're open to that spiritual realm in a, in a way that really is playing around in a realm they don't know. They open themselves up to it. And I believe they really, at the end of the day, are, in a sense, inviting this on themselves. Um, I don't think demons do have the power to just take over a man. I don't think God has given them necessarily that power. We don't see that anywhere. But I think if a person plays around with it long enough, there's a sense in which they're yielding themselves to that. And again, I can't state that as a definitive, this is the doctrine of demon possession. We don't really have one. We don't really know how it all works. But my point to mainly those here tonight is stay away from that stuff. You don't have to worry about it, you know. And if you're a Christian, you don't have to worry about it. But stay away from that stuff. Why would you mess around with those spiritual things that have no place in the life of the Christian? So this man is stricken in a very serious way. And probably some of his own doing, playing in areas he ought not to have played around with. But ultimately, when a man like this comes forward and is brought to Jesus, he finds compassion. Ultimately, a man like this, just like the blind man, what was Jesus' response to his disciples in John 9 when they said, who sinned, this man or his parents? And Jesus is like, no, you got it all wrong. He was born blind so that God might be glorified. This man is afflicted so that God might be glorified. This man is afflicted so that a miracle might be recorded in Matthew that we can learn from and grow from and learn who Christ is. Ultimately, that's why this man and all of the afflictions we see in Scripture are for God's purposes. And all of the afflictions you experience are for God's purposes, aren't they? 
You will not get written in Scripture, Scripture of the canon is closed. You, your story will not be written there, but it might be useful in the life of, if your own life and sanctification, the life of others for sanctification. And so, um, this man is extremely afflicted. Why would the demon keep him from speaking? And perhaps hearing, we don't know that for sure, but why would a demon want to keep somebody from speaking? I, I don't know if you, we can say that definitively either, but I think we can say this. The enemy hates God and hates everything he does and creates and all the good that God does. And so when God created man, what did he say? It's good. It's very good, right? When he finished creation, it's very good. What does Satan want to do? He wants to just oppose everything God does, including God's creation of man and God's function for man. He wants to mess with it. The enemy just doesn't, he's not necessarily very discriminate in what he ruins in God's creation or what he ruins in God's, God's work and handiwork, but he just wants to mess with God's plan. That's what he wants to do. And so he thinks, I'm sure, or this particular demon maybe, and we don't know how all that works, the realms of demons and the hierarchies and all, we don't know how all that works. But it would seem to me that one of them, or maybe all of them, said, we'll have better luck if we get this guy to not speak. This will do something. And of course, what Satan means for evil, God means for good. And we can have confidence in our God. And so he opposes this man's speech and these people bring this man to Jesus. And I love how Matthew says it next. Look at your text. Uh, Matthew says, I don't know how your translation says it, but mine, I love what he says. Verse 32, now as they were going out, behold, a mute demon-possessed man was brought to him. And after the demon was cast out, the mute man spoke. Not about you, but if I, you've read, we, we've studied the other miracles in Matthew so far. We're waiting for the interaction. Now, he's a mute man, so you can say, well, there won't be a lot of interaction from the mute man, right? But at least Jesus could say something here, right? At least Jesus could say, you know, well, I see their faith, and I'm going to go ahead. At least Matthew could make a little commentary. Or Matthew could maybe point out how Jesus, maybe he grabbed onto his tongue, you know, like he touched the blind man's eyes and grabbed onto his tongue, or... Or maybe Jesus stood back and said, now, demon, come out. You know, I mean, maybe Matthew could just give us a little more, but what does Matthew do? He says, and when the demon came out, it's a foregone conclusion. I think Matthew has come to the point where he's like, I don't need to tell you what happens here. You already know what's going to happen. I don't even need to describe it. I don't need to tell you about it when the demon was cast out. I don't need to tell you, look, Jesus' power is greater than demons. You already know that. You've seen him cast out the demons out of these violent men. I've shared that with you. And so now we can just skip past all of that and say, and when the demons cast out. Because you as readers, as astute readers, already know, as students of, of my gospel, Matthew says, you already know the demons getting cast out. Jesus has won every battle. In fact, Jesus has never faced a battle. Do you know that? Jesus never really faced a battle. Because a battle indicates that he might have some type of struggle to win it. Jesus is undefeated. And Jesus is really unchallenged. There is no challenge for God. Do you know that? God has no challenges. You know, we face things in our lives and we think, that's a challenge. God, this is really a challenge, what's in front of me today. God has no challenge. There's no real challenge for God. He does what he wills as he wills to do it without any opposition whatsoever. You say, wait a minute, people oppose him. That's like a mosquito on an elephant. I mean, that, no, that's maybe too drastic of an example. It's got to be worse than that. It's less than a mosquito on an elephant. God is not opposed by anything. And so Matthew just, uh, I think he understands. Astute students of the word of God know already the demon gets cast out. You could have written this story yourself. The demon gets cast out. You know that. And I love the way Matthew just steps back and lets us, lets us read. Oh, we know. We know, Matthew. We knew that was going to happen. We saw that coming, Matthew. Thank you. And the demon is cast out. And then 
The man speaks. The man speaks. No speech therapy. No, you know, try saying this first. You know, he's just totally healed and able to speak. He's able to communicate instantly. And Jesus once again shows his miraculous power to restore this man's speech, to cast out the demon. Just multiple things going on here. And for Jesus, it's a day that ends in Y. For us, this is cool, this is awesome, this is special. But for Jesus, this is just another day. This is commonplace for him. This is not a big deal for him. Like, we're looking at this, it's a big deal for that mute, demon-possessed man. It's a big deal for his friends. It's a big deal to read about. If we were facing a situation, we'd be like, I don't know what to do. I've never faced a demon-possessed man as far as I know. I don't know what to do with that. You know, well, in the name of Jesus. Uh, well, we saw what happened in Acts. You know, I mean, I know about Jesus. I know about Paul. Who do you think you are? You know, I don't know if I'm supposed to do that or not. I wouldn't know what to do. It'd be overwhelm me. But to Jesus, this is nothing. I love that. We, we should have confidence in him, shouldn't we? The one who saved our soul, what he is able to do is so amazing and this is the first response we see is that this mute demon-possessed man is brought to Jesus. They respond to the word of Christ given by the blind man to bring their friend to Christ. And we see this response, and I believe, and I can't say, I can't point to anything in this text other than the fact that this man spoke, but I believe all of these Miracles that occur in chapters 8 and 9, I believe each one of those people were redeemed people at the end of the day. I believe that each one was redeemed by God, that their greatest need was taken care of along with their physical need. I believe Jesus met both in all of these people. I'm not saying everyone Jesus healed, he saved. I don't believe that necessarily. I believe he probably healed many who never came to Christ, who never truly had faith in him. I believe he did that. But I believe these ones that Matthew records, I believe each one, and this was the only one that's really hard to go and find in the text where he's redeemed. I think we can see that in the other cases. Here it's a little more veiled, if you will, but I believe that every one of them was redeemed. And I believe this man was redeemed, and I believe he was redeemed by the message, by the preaching of the word of Christ. He was redeemed by Christ, but he was redeemed because of the message of the preachers. The blind men. And I see, I think I see Matthew connecting those things together. And so that's the first response we see is someone coming to Christ. That's the first response we see. But we see a second response here in verse 33. The response of the crowds. And after the demon was cast out, the mute man spoke, and the crowds marveled, saying, Nothing like this has ever been seen in Israel. The crowds are marveling, they're in wonder, they're, in, they're just awestruck. This is amazing! You would be too. It might be hard to get amazed as we just read it, but if we saw this, we would all be just... I mean, our jaws would drop and we would just be amazed. And the crowds were amazed. Those who, maybe those who had followed him maybe just joined in the crowd recently and they were waiting to see their first miracle. And those guys are like, wow, that was so cool. Do it again. You know, you just hear them say, I want to see another one. That was awesome. I love seeing the power of God. They're amazed by him. But I want you to know many people marvel at Jesus, but they don't commit themselves to follow him. You know, Mahatma Gandhi marveled at Jesus. He marveled at Jesus. He said, I like your Christ, but I do not like your Christians. That's what Mahatma Gandhi said. He, he said he studied Christ and he liked Christ. Now, if he really studied and knew Christ, he would have probably hated Christ, actually, because he would have known that Christ was going to judge him for his sins. And he never came to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ as far as any of us could ever know. And so he really rejected Christ, even though he marveled at him. He just marveled at the wisdom of Christ, the teaching of Christ. And 
We have Richard Dawkins. He marveled at the intel- he marvels still today at, at, at the intelligence of Jesus. In fact, he said Jesus was so intelligent, I'm sure he would have been an atheist. That's, that's the line from Richard Dawkins, you know, and it just shows how intelligent Richard Dawkins is. Um, <laughs> or how much wisdom he lacks. Maybe we should say it that way. He has no spiritual sight, does he? And so he says, well, Jesus would have been an atheist. He was so smart. He marveled at the intelligence of Jesus. You can study the Gospels and see that Jesus was an intelligent man. He was a smart man. The way he responded to different people in different situations, it's amazing. A quick wit that just was able to just, if you see him as just a man, you'd be impressed with him and how he could respond to the criticisms and the Pharisees and the questions that they asked. Many have marveled at Jesus' compassion. They see stories like this and like, what a compassionate Jesus. I love his compassion. And we should, right? Shouldn't we marvel at his compassion? And, and, and really, let that be an example to us to be compassionate to others. We marvel at the compassion of Jesus. Many have done so and not committed their lives to Jesus. They just thought, he's such a compassionate man. Many have marveled over his power and works. I've heard many marvel at his teaching. I love the fact that Jesus taught everybody to be humble. I just think that's so great. I think everybody else out there should be humble. That's what they say, you know. They don't necessarily say, I should be humble, but everybody around me should be more humble. If that were the case, this would be a great world if everybody around me was humble, as long as I don't have to be humble. And so they marvel at the teaching of Jesus in humility. In fact, many will accuse Christians, you're not much like Christ because you're not humble and you should be more humble. You proclaim the word of God as though it's absolute truth in an arrogant way. And No, actually, I proclaim the word of God as absolute truth in a humble way because it's absolute truth. And I sometimes, foolishly, might have different ideas than Scripture and I have to go, I'm wrong, Scripture's right. And I humble myself before Scripture. That's what, I'm not proclaiming me. I'm proclaiming Christ. I'm proclaiming the Word of Christ. So it's actually humility to do so. Many people marvel at all kinds of various aspects. His teaching on service, serving one another. What a wonderful teaching. They marvel at all these things, but they never give their lives to Him. They never humble themselves before Christ at the foot of the cross as a sinner in need of forgiveness. So they just marvel. And that's what the crowds are doing here. They don't confess him as Lord in Christ. They just marvel. Nothing's been done like this in Israel. Ever. We've never seen anything like this. Interestingly enough, that very statement, well, maybe not like this, not to this extent, not to this magnitude, but miracles have been done in Israel before, haven't they? Go back to Moses, and Moses did miracles saw things miraculous. Go back to Elijah and Elisha. There were miracles. Now, not, not, not to the magnitude or the extent of what Jesus did. And Jesus' dispensation of miracles, if you want to call it that, is, is to a much greater de- degree than Moses and Elijah. Much greater degree. And that should have said something, right? Like, if this is greater than Moses and greater than Elijah, then who is this? He must be the Christ. He must be the son of David. He must be the chosen one of God. But yet, the crowds just marveled. They just were amazed. But they never took the next level. They never got spiritual sight to see Jesus as they ought to see him, as he truly is, as Lord and Christ. You know, we marvel at things. Don't we? I marvel at athletes. Man, sometimes I see, I haven't watched football in a long time, but I did love to watch football. And sometimes I'd see a catch and I'd be like, how did that guy make that catch? Or I'd see a throw, how'd that guy make that throw? Or I'd see a tackle, wow, what a hit, man, that guy can hit. I'd be marveling at those things. I've never believed in an athlete, though, for my eternal salvation. I marveled at him, but I would never say, you know, I want to go to heaven based on you. Nope, not at all. I've marveled at artists musicians. I've marveled at the wisdom of a judge or the intelligence of a mathematician, but I'm not putting my hope 
and eternal life in any of them. You can marvel at much, but that does not mean you're putting your faith in them, does it? And these crowds marvel. If we don't put our faith in these people, we marvel at. These people here in the crowd marveled at Jesus. And that's not a bad thing. In fact, Christian, if you haven't marveled at Jesus in a while, maybe you should go home and do some marveling. You know, read some scripture and marvel at the works of Jesus. I've said that before, haven't I? I mean, as we've studied these, these things can become so commonplace. Yeah, Jesus did another miracle. And we don't marvel anymore. I think maybe even Matthew's calling us a little bit. Are you still marveling? I've, I've recorded about 10 miracles at this point. Do you still have a little marveling going on? The crowds are marveling. Boy, if you are a Christ follower, you should marvel even more. Because you know he does greater things than these. And we should all have a little marveling going on in our hearts. And so these men, uh, this crowd, I mean, they, they marvel, they're amazed, but they do not submit themselves to Christ to follow him. That's the second response. Then we have the third response by the Pharisees in verse 34. But the Pharisees were saying, he casts out the demons by the ruler of the demons. The Pharisees here, it's interesting, by their own admission, they tell us that Jesus casts out demons. There's, a, there's an admission here. We can't deny the power of Jesus over demonic forces, over demons. We can't deny it. I mean, if they could have denied it, they would have said, he doesn't cast out demons. That's foolishness. No, these miracles were so confirmed. The evidence was so strong that the enemies of Jesus had to say, he does them. He does it. That's strong evidence for the miracles of Jesus. That his enemies even had to confess. He does do miracles. And so we've got to assign this power that he has to something, to someone. And what's amazing is, is that they hate Jesus so much that they assign the power of God in him to Satan, to the enemy, to their supposed enemy. I mean, they would have said, that's why they're accusing him of being linked up with Satan, right? Because everybody hates Satan. I mean, we, we have all a common enemy. Even the world would say, oh, I don't like Satan either, you know? I mean, they would claim Satan to be their enemy, but they would rather take the power of God and assign it to Satan. Why? Because they don't want to believe Jesus. You got to remember, going back earlier in the chapter when Jesus said, you can't take a new patch and put it on an old garment. One thing that the, the Pharisees do agree with Jesus on is that the old garment and the new patch won't fit together. The Pharisees understand that. They understand what Jesus is doing, the new patch, doesn't fit with our religion, the old garment. They know it. These two will not coincide. They know that what Jesus is doing will not work for their religion. What Jesus is teaching will not work for their system. I would tell you this. If they thought Jesus was just going to take old patch and put it on the old garment, just reform their religion a little bit, just give a little nuance to their system, just, just help them keep their system intact with just a little new information, I think the Pharisees would have signed him up. The Pharisees would have said, come along with us, Jesus, you're just fine. And bring the power with you. But when they knew Jesus was going to destroy the system, not the law and the prophets, the system that they built that was corrupt. Jesus did not come to abolish the law and the prophets. He came to fulfill them. And when the Pharisees realized what he teaches abolishes what we're doing because if he's right, the people are going to know we're wrong. And we can't be wrong. They're so arrogant. I was sharing with our basic course people, one of the things that needs to be important to the Christian especially, and I was talking in particular about leadership in the church, it needs to be that, that we want to get it right, not that we want to be right. And those are two different things. At the end of the day, when I make a decision as a leader, I want to make the right decision. And I might make a decision or want to make a decision that's the wrong decision. 
And rather than say, no, I must be right, even though I'm wrong, what do I want to do? I want to change my decision. I want to be right. So I've got to get it right. But sometimes we want to be right so badly, we refuse to change our minds. We refuse to repent. We refuse to turn. These men are so vested, invested into their system, into the old garment, that they're like, we can't become new wineskins. We don't like the new wine. If you put the new wine, Jesus and his teaching and all that comes with it, into our old wineskin system, it's going to blow up. Incompatible, we want to remain old wineskins. And so what do they do? They reject the new wine. They see the power of God in Jesus and they say, that must come from Satan. That's where it comes from. Because there's no other possible explanation. Because what could it be? Well, give me another explanation that it could be. They couldn't cast out demons. They didn't have the power, so men couldn't have the power. They knew that. Men can't have the power. So it's got to be God or it's got to be Satan. It's got to be one of the two. And they choose Satan because of their investment in their old garment, because of their being old wineskins and wanting to remain old wineskins, because they had... They were seeing naturally. They were seeing their power. They were seeing their authority. And Jesus was a complete threat to it all. Because they knew if they go his way, we're done. Our system falls apart. Paul knew that, didn't he? Paul, when he came to Christ on the road to Damascus, when he made a decision for Christ, or when Christ made a decision for Paul, maybe, if you want to put it that way, right? Because Christ met Paul. Paul was going to crucify Christ or persecute his Christians anyway, right? He was going to, going to torture Christians and put them in prison for trial and execution. He, he had no intentions. He was not on the road to Damascus saying, boy, I hope I can meet Christ on the road to Damascus, you know? Nope. Christ met Paul on the road to Damascus. And Paul knew later, all that I did prior to Christ is dung. Poop. I know I'm not supposed to say that word in the pulpit, but that's what it is. It's filthy dung. Gross. Disgusting. It all is rubbish. I love that. He recognized this is something new. What I did before had no value. Christ has all the value. He knew that. And to the Pharisees' credit, so did they. They just chose to keep their own system. And they rejected Christ. And so we see that. And I would tell you this, that their response, is, as much as their response may be distasteful to us, their response results in the same thing the crowd, crowd's response does, doesn't it? Unbelief. You can be hardened in unbelief, or you can just be gradually, casually unbelief. Doesn't matter. You can marvel at Jesus being unbelief. You can hate Jesus and be in unbelief. But at the end of the day, your destination is the same. There's only one who, out of these three responses, who is redeemed. Only one. And I think about the blind men who go out and spread the news about Jesus. And I think about one man responding that we have recorded. There may have been more, but there was one. I remember when Denny and I had moved down here maybe in less than a year. And uh, we had gone through a lot to get here. You know, and I'm not talking about the move and the candidating process. Oh, you guys were torture on us. No, you weren't. Uh, I'm not talking about that. We went through a lot just previous to all of that. God had brought us through difficult, hard circumstances on the way into ministry. And Whew, you know, I mean, there were days I was just, I remember walking, Danny and I, we used to walk, and we went on a walk, and, uh, and I'm out there talking to her, and I'm just, I don't know what God's doing. God, this hurts. This is painful. This is miserable. I don't like this, God. I just, just put us where you want us, and let's get it over with. You know, rip the band-aid off, right? That's how we all are. I don't know how you are, but that's how I am. I, I gotta take. I don't want it hair by hair. I want to rip that thing off. You know, let's go. Let's get on with life. And and no, God had me through a slow process of pulling the bandaid off, and I didn't like it. I was so uncomfortable. 
We had been here about less than a year. We had an opportunity to minister to somebody in kind of a unique way that would really, I mean, materially anyway, change the trajectory of their life. And we were hoping spiritually, and maybe the jury's still out on that um, for this individual. But I remember telling Denny, we were driving down the road, and I said, you know, what if, what if God brought us to Norton, brought us to Norton Baptist Church, and brought us to this area to impact one life? Would it be worth it to impact this one individual's life? And he brought us here sovereignly by his grace, and we went through all of that misery to see God work in one person's life. Wouldn't that be worth it? And we agreed. Definitely worth it. Definitely worth it. And we, God in his grace has used us to impact more lives than one. I don't know why. I'm not deserving. Not worthy of that. But in his kindness and goodness, as I've tried to be faithful and failed at many points, God has chosen to let us be an impact on people's lives. And, and, and that's the way he likes to minister, right? That's the God-ordained means of ministering is through his people. And I think about what I challenged us to this morning about getting out there and sharing the gospel, being assured in our faith and getting out there and sharing the gospel. And, and you might say, yeah, but I've shared the gospel a thousand times and I've not heard a response yet. But what if God used you for one? What if God used you for one? Would it, the thousand no's and the rejection and the persecution, wouldn't that be worth it? Like, wow, God used me in that way. Praise God for that. What have you impacted one life here at Norton, maybe a fellow believer, and encouraged them in their faith? Wouldn't that be worth it? I tell you, if you're the mute demon-possessed man who was freed from a demon and able to speak afterwards, whatever those blind men did, it was worth it to him, wasn't it? It was worth it to him. He's, and, and I mean, if you are the one who receives Christ through the ministry of somebody else, you go, whatever they had to endure to do it, it was worth it because here I am, redeemed by Christ. And God used these people to impact my life. Now, let me tell you, you're going to get more responses from guys like people in the crowd, right? They might marvel. That's really cool, that gospel thing you shared. I like that. That's really neat. Maybe someday that'll be me. I've heard that before. <laughs> Why not today? <laughs> Eh, maybe someday. Yeah, someday. You might get mocked like the Pharisees. You might get accused. You are doing the work of the devil. You know, that's what some people might say to somebody who shares the gospel. In fact, you know, you might get that persecution when you share the real gospel from professing Christians. That's not the gospel. The gospel is that God just loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. That's the whole gospel. No, it's not the whole gospel. I mean, let me tell you, if you're in your sin, God has a wonderful plan to pour his wrath on you for all eternity in hell unless you repent. If you want to call that to that person a wonderful plan, I would call it a wonderful plan from their perspective anyway. I would instead share with them the truth and say, but if you come to him, he's a gracious and merciful God who will forgive you and who will heal you and cleanse you and wash you, right? The real gospel, but some people don't like the real gospel. And so you might get accused of being a tool of Satan, of working for the other team. You might get a varying response through your own proclamation of the word of Christ. Now, there's something here that I do want to share, though, in these last three miracles. I mean, there's, there's the woman with the issue of blood, and I don't mean to be rude, but we're going to skip her in these three sections. Here <laughs> we're going to talk about the three miracles. Um, she's important, don't get me wrong, we already talked about her, but I want to focus on these last three miracles Matthew does here, just in closing, because I want you to see something that I think, I think Matthew is up to. Um, now, I'm going to say, this could be speculation, so you meditate and think on it yourself, and just see, are these things, are these things true? Is that, is that what Matthew's doing? I, I think it is, and I think it's 
really cool because Matthew first talks about the synagogue official's daughter who was raised to life, right? And we said there that we need to be made alive in Christ, Ephesians chapter 2. Matthew then gives us these blind men who can't see and Christ comes and gives them sight. And don't we need spiritual sight? We need God to give us spiritual sight to be able to see. So he makes us alive, he gives us spiritual sight, and then what is going on with the, with the mute tongue? We were in 2 Corinthians 4 this morning. Turn there if you would. That was the scripture reading Dan did for us this morning. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Now, I'm not saying Paul was thinking of Matthew when he wrote this, and I'm not saying Matthew was thinking of Paul when he wrote those three miracles, but I want us to look just a little bit at 2 Corinthians 4 in closing here. First, I want us to look at verses 3 through 6. And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing, in whose case the God of this age has blinded the minds of the unbelieving so that they might not see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For we do not preach ourselves, but Jesus Christ is Lord, and ourselves as your slaves for the sake of Jesus. For God who said, light shall shine out of darkness, is the one who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. Does that not remind you of the blind men? They needed sight. And Christ shone into their lives and opened their eyes to see. And for us spiritually, Christ has shone into our hearts so that we might see who he is. And that's why we see, right? We have spiritual sight because of Christ's work in us to cause us to see that it's been shown into our hearts by him. So we have the blind seeing here. Now look with me at verses 7 through 12. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels, so that the surpassing greatness of the power will be of God and not from ourselves. In every way afflicted but not crushed, perplexed but not despairing, persecuted but not forsaken, struck down but not destroyed, always carrying about in the body the dying of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our body. For we who live are constantly being delivered over to death for Jesus' sake, so that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our mortal flesh, so death works in us, but life in you. We need to be raised to new life. And if you remember what Paul said, Paul said, I die daily. I die every day. Well, Paul, if you die every day, how do you live? Because Christ lives in me, right? Because when I get out of the way, this is a prayer of mine, oftentimes a group of us meet sometimes on Sunday morning and pray most Sunday mornings and and sometimes my prayer is just get me out of the way, God. You know, just move, remove me from the way. I don't want to get in the way of your work today. And I could. I could let my pride, I could let my frustrations, I could let my distractions get in the way of what God desires. Now, God's going to still do what he's going to do. I know that. And he'd probably even do it through my foolishness and my idiocy. Idiocy. I've seen him do that many times in my life. But I don't want to get in his way. I want to die and let Christ live in me. I want to be a a willing vessel. I need Christ to live in me. Give me life, Christ. Isn't that our daily cry? Christ, make me alive. You say, well, he made me alive at salvation. Yes, and he makes you alive today and tomorrow and the next day. You continue to die and he continues to give you life just as he gave life to the synagogue official's daughter. But why does he make us alive and why does he take away our blind eyes? What is the purpose behind that? Look with me at verses 13 through 15. But having the same spirit of faith, according to what is written, I believed, therefore I what? Spoke. I believe, therefore I spoke. We also believe, therefore we also speak, knowing that he who raised the Lord Jesus will raise us also with Jesus and will present us with you. For all things are for your sake, so the grace which is spreading to more and more people may cause the giving of thanks to abound to the glory of God. Let me tell you, when God doesn't make people alive and give them spiritual sight by his miraculous power and then turn around and give them a mute tongue or leave them with a mute tongue or leave their tongue in service of Satan, what does he do? He loosens our tongue 
He says, Paul says, I believe, therefore I spoke. I was made alive. I was caused to see spiritually. And because of that, I speak. I preach the word of Christ, Paul said. And I believe each of us are to teach and preach the word of Christ and share the word of Christ with our tongues. He loosens our tongues. He gives us the ability. He takes our tongue, which was in service, by the way, to Satan. Look what James says about the tongue. What a, how it can light a forest fire on fire. It can burn a, burn a woods down, you know. It's powerful. It's small. But it's powerful, like a rudder on a ship, James says. And we, before Christ, used it in the service of Satan. But now, when he gives us new life and gives us spiritual sight, it's now useful for the king of the kingdom. It's now useful to speak about the king of the kingdom. And again, he doesn't make us alive and give us spiritual sight and leave us with a mute tongue. Instead, he gives us a tongue that can speak. And I believe that's what Matthew is ultimately driving at here in these three miracles, is that the God who makes you alive, Jesus makes you alive, Jesus makes you see, and then Jesus causes you to go out and spread the news. In fact, two times in that section, he says the news spread throughout the land after Jairus, or after, well, it's Jairus, but the synagogue officials, I just like to stick with Matthew. The synagogue officials, the other texts say it's Jairus. The synagogue official, after his daughter is raised from the dead, that news spread throughout all the land. After the blind men receive their sight, they spread it throughout all the land. Twice that is pointed out. And then we end with this loosened tongue. And I believe Matthew is pointing out we ought to be spreading the news. And then he's going to go into the fields are white, ready for harvest. Pray that the God of the harvest would send laborers into his field. And I believe Matthew is really driving this point home to us through these pictures of these miracles because he's not worried about giving us the chronology of how these things happen. He wants to teach us something. He wants to teach us that we are instruments of God. And I believe this, if we have spiritual sight and we are made alive, that we will speak. We will speak. We will get opportunities to speak. And I think we need to prepare ourselves for those opportunities to speak. But I think in order to do so, we've got to put on that heavenly mindset. We've got to see with our spiritual sight. And I think that's a big part of our problem. We look so materially, don't we? Day by day by day. Because the material is coming at us all the time, isn't it? Bills and, and uh, problems in this world and people who oppose or are hard to deal with or whatever it is. Our family gives us trouble and, oh, the world is just coming at Politics, oh, my goodness, how bad is it? And so we tend to bring our sight down to the natural but what does Paul say in the end of this chapter? And I think it's instructive for us tonight to help us. As we spread the word, as the crowds reject us, as the Pharisees reject us, look at verse 16, therefore we do not lose heart. But though our outer man is decaying, yet our inner man is being renewed day by day. For our momentary light affliction. Now wait a second. Momentary and light, Paul. Let's go back up. In every way, afflicted. In every way, afflicted. Momentary and light? I'm, I'm sorry, that does not sound momentary and light to me. What else does he say? But not crushed, he does add that. Perplexed, but not despairing. Persecuted, struck down. Momentary and light. Momentary and light. Why? Because it's material. Because it's physical. Because it's not spiritual. And Paul has a spiritual sight on. And he's not looking at the material and the physical and the difficulties in this life. What is he looking at? For a momentary light affliction is working out for us an eternal weight of glory far beyond all comparison. Weight of glory, eternal weight, momentary, eternal, light, weighty. What do you want? 
Which do you want to focus on? Where do we want our focus on? Light, momentary, or weighty and eternal? I want my focus on that. If I've got weighty and eternal, what difference does light and, light and momentary mean? What difference is that? And that's where his focus is, and so he goes on, far beyond all comparison. While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Set your mind on things above. Set your affections on heavenly things. Why? Because it will help you remember Whatever happens in this life is momentary and light. I want to tell you, the mute man one day died. It's not recorded in Scripture, but he's not here anymore. You can't find this man. You know why? Because he died and his tongue stopped speaking. The blind men died and their eyes stopped working. The young lady that was raised to life, she's dead too today. They all died. If the whole point here was only to give them physical life and better life and make their life better now they're all dead now what difference did his miracles make but it's not what he did physically it's what he did spiritually it's what he did for these people because i believe all three are redeemed and in a glory i believe we can meet these people one day and hear firsthand testimony maybe the mute man will say you know i don't know why matthew didn't record more it was really cool what jesus did you know <laughs> but all he gave me was and when the spirit, when the demon came out of him, you know, that's all I got. You know, I don't think he'll have any complaints. <laughs> but man, I can't wait. Eternal weight of glory. If we could live with that mindset, how different would our lives be? How expendable would our lives become for the cause of Christ? Let's pray. Father, we just pray that you would help us to pour ourselves out. Die daily, as Paul said. Daily living out the death of Christ so that he might live in us. We don't know what you desire to do, and we don't know how you're going to work. But boy, oh boy, do we want to be a part of it. Do we want to be a part of what you're doing? Father, because it's so important, it's so weighty, it's so great, help us to, to desire those things. And help us to somehow keep that spiritual sight before us and worry so much less about our physical sight, we pray. We need your help. We need your grace. We need your mercy because it's so easy to leave this place and immediately turn to physical sight and forget what we've seen. So we pray that you would be an ever-present help in this too, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.